Hi, this is Carol, and welcome to another episode of Analyze Asia, a podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. Today, we are going to talk about something fun. We're going to talk about games. More specifically, the future of gaming in China as seen through the lens of Tencent. And we have with us today an expert on the Chinese gaming industry, Josh Ye from South China Morning Post, SCMP. Welcome to Analyze Asia, Josh. Thanks for inviting me in. Now, Josh is a reporter from SEMP, and uh, I know we've been following each other on Twitter for actually quite some time now. And so I've seen a lot of your work and know that you focus on, you know, reporting on tech and gaming specifically, and are one of the few people who look at the Asian gaming industry. It's kind of familiar for me to talk to you, but it's actually the first time that we've spoken to each other via, via voice. That's kind of cool. It's kind of like the post-COVID world, you know, meeting fr- inter- friends on the internet in real life for the first time. A few questions about you and your career to get us started. First question, what is your current role and what do you cover for SEMP? Well, thanks, Carol. I cover tech for the South China Morning Post. Currently, my specialty lies on gaming, specifically Tens and NetEase and you know, some of the up-and-coming gaming companies like MiHoYo and such, right? So obviously, also, um, there are a lot of the peripheral industries I also look into, like live streaming, as well as the other digital media assets that you know, some of the big companies hold. So um, yeah, that's my bread and butter. And so how did you start your career? So I, when I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh as a student reporter, I got into SCMP as a graduate trainee. And then from there on, I did my rotation. And then I started as a business reporter. And from business, I sort of pivoted into tech. And then obviously, um, you know, now I cover for a tech team. And what are some lessons that you'd like to share with our audience? Lessons that you've learned through your career with uh, SCMP? I think it's a really sort of a wonderful journey that has taken me here. Obviously, um, I've always been wanting to report on the stories of Chinese entrepreneurs and then their resilience and then, you know, their battle with uh, regulators and all those things. And yeah, this is definitely a big time for a lot of those stories. Um, I think, you know, this, the, the, the lessons I've learned is just really sort of, you know, have conviction in what you what you do and what you cover, right? Because uh, there are a lot of times that I could have like, gone into different directions, but then, you know, this is a, a interesting, it takes a lot of conviction to sort of uh, focus on what you want to do. Obviously, you know, also sympathize with like, you know, people around you and then pay attention to, you know, the, the true stories around you. Um, so yeah, I think that that's the organic force that kind of propel me forward. Are you also a, a gamer yourself? I grew up around gamers. I, I wasn't a gamer until I really sort of you know, got into this. Um, and then now I'm a pretty committed, pretty devoted uh, gamer. Um, this is probably one of my uh, biggest hobbies. Yeah, so grew up kind of like a lot of the, you know, stereotypical Asian kids where studies and, you know, book learning is always uh, important. But then I grew up with, you know, people who are gaming all the time, you know, in my college dorm you know i have like you know three other roommates who like late game a lot always been around that area but then you know i just lucky enough to be able to focus on a really fun area of tech uh, as my full-time job now love what you do do what you love that's great so let's talk about tencent and the recent crackdown on them in china for our audience as you know tencent is a very well-known internet company in china the t in bat and uh, they're a major force in areas in- including digital communications with their wechat app you know payments with wechat pay and of of course, the topic of today's conversation, esports and the gaming industry. So they're a key investor or owner to quite a few major gaming studios around the world, including Riot Games, which they own 100%, um, Supercell, Le Yo, Epic Games, etc. Now, with that being said, um, can you provide an overview of their influence in the gaming industry within China and also for the rest of the world? Yeah, so Tencent is without a doubt the biggest gaming company by now by revenue. It invested a lot of the you know big name companies that you just na- uh, you just mentioned. If you look across all the different platforms, be it PC or mobile or even console, increasingly so, um, they have a huge footprint there, right? So like, if you look at uh, the top PC games, Fortnite. Uh, League of Legends, you know, they have their stake in that. If you look at mobile games, Call of Duty Mobile, PUBG Mobile, um, these are games that are built by Tencent. The influence is huge. You know, they have, they own about, uh, according to Chinese authority, they have about 40% of the market share in gaming in China. And outside of China, um, they're increasingly sort of, you know, pushing towards become 
they're increasing trying to become a global gaming company, right? So, so all the sort of major IPs, be Pokemon, be Call of Duty, be Fortnite, all these games, um, Tencent are trying to you know get hands in it. And recently, the Chinese government has launched this heavy crackdown on, on big tech in China. And so, how has Tencent been affected by the regulatory crackdown in the process? And you can you talk a little bit about what the crackdown is uh, is about? Yeah, so I, I think you know the crackdown on video games at this point, the jury is still out as to you know what Beijing really tried to accomplish with this. But then it really sort of the whole campaign kicked off, you know, in, in, in earlier this month, where a state media article called "Video Games a Digital Opium," right? So and then that really drove um, Tencent's shares down. As part of the wider crackdown, now um, Tencent's share has lost about Tencent's capitalization has lost about four hundred billion U.S. from its February peak, which is the amount equivalent to the size of uh, LVMH, the owner of uh, Louis Vuitton. And that's just, you know, astonishing, right? So, yeah. and then also in the process, you know, Tencent had sort of lost its throne as you know, Asia's most valuable company to TSMC, the Taiwanese uh, chip manufacturing company. Mm -hmm. um, so that really sort of introduced a seismic shift to um, the industry here in Asia. The gaming industry has always been walking on eggshells for a bit. So like, you know, the crackdown is somewhat expected, but also unexpected in a way that because, you know, before this, Tencent and other Chinese companies or just gaming companies in general are having a record year because of you know the pandemic. They're buying up uh, gaming assets all over the world at record speed. So the crackdown comes amid the context of you know China trying to roll out uh, the miners protection law to sort of help to protect miners from excessive use of the internet as well as other entertainment products, as well as Beijing's effort to rein in you know some of the big tech companies, be it for uh, its control or, or or for other reasons. So what do you think is you know the Chinese government's rationale for the crackdown in the gaming industry? You you mentioned a bit about you know minor production is there anything else yeah so i think that big tech regulation is just a global trend and then regulations in china are not so dissimilar from those you know in in, in other countries but then Be beijing's crackdown on tech is also you know comes you know fast and furious right so its rationale behind it is very much focusing on protection of um, the miners as well as you know just try to exercise was it uh, try to displace authority and then trying to rein in some of the big tech companies. There, there are other aspects of the, the crackdown, control over data, control over uh, the capital market. And then because there's a bit of a tech war between uh, China and U.S., so then control over data is very important. Um, that's seen you know, in the case of DD. And then um, when it comes to gaming, uh, games also can also generate a lot of uh, data, right? You know, from children all the way to the like, adult, because you know every move of yours, um, you know, that entails you know some kind of data touch points. Those those are also things that Beijing is looking into. Yeah, and and I have a, a little theory to add. And a, as you probably know, uh, there's also been a crackdown in the you know um, after school like tutoring that kind of a space K to twelve like education. You know, outside of your um, required education space. And, and t I think it's very recently, the third child policy also finally became law. And there's a proposal to allow for, you know, uh, for families to have four kids instead of just three. So I feel like gaming, uh, which is, it gives such a big headache to so many parents. Um, you know, all of this is also an effort to make child raising uh, easier uh, for, you know, the next generation of uh, Chinese parents. But that's just my my theory, my take. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people trying to connect those dots. And then obviously now number one priority to, uh, for, for China is to boost its uh, birth rate, right? And yes, right. the population crisis, that's like the elephant in the room. That's certainly part of this consideration. So anything that stands in the way of, you know, China trying to achieve those state objectives will be uh, targeted. And then I think games also um, are, are, are being considered, you know, um, it's, it's sort of you know, pros and cons are being weighed by the Chinese government. So I, I think that, you know, that's also a key incentive, you know, behind which they want to, you know, keep uh, gaming within control. These gaming companies are getting far too big, you know, having far too, uh, far too much influence in, in, in what kids in China sort of believe and aspire to and all those things. Definitely. So how has, you know, Tencent responded to, to such crackdowns and criticism? I mean, I don't think anyone would like to be called, you know, spiritual opium. Yeah, I think that's where the twists and turns come in, right? Because I think it's important to stress out that China 
has been actually very supportive of you know uh, video games development over the years, and increasingly is seeing it as the sort of vehicle for cultural exports. So you know, esports and uh, gaming tournaments are are being sort of promoted in China uh, in many ways. But then at the same time, that game addiction is a real threat. It's a real problem that uh, Beijing has to sort of wrestle with, right? Because you know, if too many people get Hooked on games. Too many children get hooked on games. Beijing has been receiving a lot of complaints from parents about you know whether the government should do something about that. This whole picture that has a lot of complexities to it. Definitely, I don't know if this exists in other parts of the world. Maybe maybe in Korea I can see it, but in China there are these you know gaming addiction centers, right? Where where they try to you know help these kids who who have fallen into the hands of um, internet addiction, but mainly gaming addiction. Yeah, so it's a definitely a real problem. I, I think the biggest theme here, and you know, all the sort of confusions, all the sort of you know market route that have taken place recently, flex this love pay relationship Beijing has with video games, right? So this is also not the first time that China has you know compared video games to uh, poisonous drugs, right? So it has happened on two different occasions in the past, and then they both led to very dire consequences. The first time is you know in in, in the year of two thousands when China called gaming digital heroin. So a different kind of drug, but you know, also very, very, very detrimental to public health. After that, it moved to ban console gaming from China. So at the time, you know, console games were sort of growing big. Uh, the likes of Nintendo, PlayStation, all those guys. The consoles are being being traded in China. But then it came the console ban, and then um, it drove the ca- console gaming market into in, into the shadow. So um, for 15 years, it wasn't until 2015 that the console gaming ban was lifted. And it was through like a pilot program in Shang in Shanghai, and it was a uh, huge news at the time. And the second time was you know with the rise of uh, mobile games, especially uh, Honor of Kings, which is Tencent's marquee game. And 2007 also described on Honor of Kings as you know a poisonous drug. And at the time, actually, sort of the state media broadside at uh, Tencent was a whole lot more serious, you know, than 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 what we have seen this month. And uh, Ma Huateng, Tong, uh, Pony Ma, the founder of Tencent, actually made a visit to to pay people's daily uh, after uh, after state media sort of you know published consecutive pieces you know attacking Honor of Kings, right? That led to the introduction of for first time spending limits as well as playtime limit in Honor of Kings. But what came after that is even more serious. So it introduced a licensing freeze to all the games that can be published in China. So unlike video games elsewhere. In order to be able to release a game in China, video game companies have to acquire a government approval in China now to publish a game. So at the time, they sort of put a nine-month freeze on the licenses. That led to more than twenty-eight thousand gaming companies going under in two thousand eighteen and two thousand nineteen. Ironically, that tightening of the game license supply didn't really hurt big companies like Tencent, which mm-hmm. have you know, which at the time had plenty of spare licenses. That's a key reason why that you know this time when games were compared to spiritual opium, it led to such a significant market route that wiped out nearly hundred million uh, U.S. dollars of market uh, value in gaming stocks. Yeah, I was actually going to mention the licensing ban in 2018 as well. So this time around, it's uh, even more serious. You're saying? I, I think this time around, we're waiting and seeing. At this point, I don't think that it would lead to as serious a consequence as it had in 2018, 2017. Because I think that right now, over the years, you know, gaming companies like Tencent, Billy, Billy, NetEase, these companies have all introduced very serious anti-addiction uh, measures to um, to to help them offset those concerns. I, I think it's also safe to say that gaming companies like Tencent and NetEase have accumulated quite a bit of like lobbying power inside mm-hmm. the Chinese system. I guess the biggest sign that this time may not be as serious is that. Just hours after the state media call um, video game spiritual PM, it backed that very controversial line, right? You know, it, it took it took uh, it deleted the, the article first, and then we published the article without that line. I think that you know is a very sign that goes to show um, Tencent had quite a bit of lobbying power, and the gaming industry had a quite a bit of lobbying power in Beijing now because you know Beijing had been trying to promote the game development industry for a long time. And you mentioned a little bit about you know some of the actions that they've taken such as putting uh, like time play limit etc. What are some of the other actions that they've done and, and have these actions um, you know appease the, the Chinese government? 
Yeah, I think you know, jury is still out on whether or not these anti-addiction measures are you know, working as advertised because you know, a lot of times and, you know, there are plenty of features game companies trying to introduce you know, to, to stop teenagers from playing games, right? For example, you know, beyond the obvious game time limit, um, the play time limit, the spending limit and the uh, game time limit, they're also um, they're trying to have a real name registration system um, mm-hmm. That connect to your um, national ID, so that you know they can verify who the player is. In addition to that, there are also like that. There are also talks about trying to implement facial recognition features to games, where um, you really have to lock in you know, with your real face, right? That being said, there are a lot of things that Tencent doesn't tell you about. Is that there are still many ways to bypass it, right? So like you know, you see, following the introduction of these curfew and these bending limits you see uh, around the country there are like you know mobile gaming cafe pop so like just you know small merchants trying to you know turn quick profit and use you know give their accounts to children who can come just uh, lock lock in with an adult account and then also like you know kids are now pressuring their parents you know trying to like lock in with their uh, parents accounts so there are a lot of these you know like little little, little nuances there definitely worth paying attention to and because we know that tencent it's a global company now right in terms of gaming so how has you know Beijing's crackdown impacted their gaming business worldwide has it just you know lowered the access of global game studios into china or are there any unintended consequences i think actually is accelerating um, Chinese gaming companies desire to go abroad and then their momentum to go abroad because of the licensing free I just talked about at around 2019 2018 you know the whole theme is about you know bringing Chinese games to overseas markets and with the Chinese market be- becoming increased competitive and crowded as well as heavily regulated companies like Tencent and NetEase and all these very competitive gaming companies are looking overseas for further development. You know, this trend is bound to make, you know, Tencent and NetEase even a more global company, you know, than it is. So like if you look at uh, Tencent's recent moves, they started three AAA game development studios in North America. And, you know, that's at record pace, right? NetEase also like, you know, starting uh, development studios in Montreal and Tokyo. So these are all efforts made to uh, create games for the Western audience as well as, you know, uh, for players in overseas markets. Yeah, I was just going to ask because I know you also cover, you know, some other companies in this in the space. And we know that, you know, a rising tide can lift or sink all boats. So how about the other gaming giants in China? Like you mentioned, NetEase and, and Bilibili. How have they or will they be affected by, by this crackdown? They are definitely affected by the crackdown right now. Uh, the most obvious aspect of it is in their share price, right? You know, uh, all tech companies, you know, gaming companies as well have been seeing a plunge in their share prices. So nobody's immune to this whole tidal wave. But at the same time, I think that this momentum that these companies have been on trying to develop their own high quality games made for global audience, like that trend is set to continue. So I think inevitably, all these companies will try to sort of further restrict some children from playing their games. Now, like Tencent is saying that only 2.6% of its uh, gaming revenues in China were contributed by um, players under the age of 16. And Billy Billy, you know, today just reported saying that, you know, they're only 1% of their gaming revenue came from those under age of 18. So they would definitely try to put out a lot more of these kind of features to limit underage gamers. I think that the crackdown that applies to everybody in the space, but then I think gaming is definitely, you know, bound to continue its growth, be it in China or uh, overseas. If like China is you know becoming more regulated, then you know these companies would definitely look overseas and put a whole lot more resources there. Although I'm a little bit doubtful of the numbers, you know, given if minors could just use their or have to use their you know parents' credit cards or, or ways of payment in order to make in-app purchases, etc. Now, given the limits you know set by the Chinese government, where do you think Tencent will focus their efforts on moving forward? Right now, one of the biggest headlines regarding Tencent is that they pledged 50 billion yuan fund dedicated to common prosperity, which is uh, President Xi Jinping's key economic and social goal, right? They would definitely allocate a whole lot more sort of, uh, resources and funds to trying to facilitate you know, President Xi's you know, vision for uh, social equality and all these things. It's worth mentioning that the 50 billion yuan fund dedicated to common prosperity came after Tencent already pledged another 50 billion to the sustainable growth of uh, innovation back in April. So, you know, that brought us to about 
hundred billion yuan, just you know to help out the country's social causes. So that's you know one key area that Tencent is gonna focus on to get itself in you know Beijing's good graces and all. But then you know on the gaming side, I think that Tencent had in in lead up this whole crackdown at the end of June was it in the first half of this year. Tencent invi- uh, invested in sixty two video games companies uh, around the world. That's about was it. One gaming deal every three days, and and, and that's a record speed. So I think Tencent truly does believe in games. In probably in the very in the very beginning, Tencent, a company founded by a bunch of non gamers, just saw games as a, a, a easy revenue source for the, in the internet business. But then I think that right now they have really sort of you know laid the groundwork for them to do very advanced sort of you know uh, technology in, in in gaming. So especially like in Epic Games, Epic Games is you know. Right now, it's more than just you know making games, right? It's more company look look at like simulation tech, I think. And then they're also in talks. They've also been like looking into maybe acquiring a stake or like buying Crytek, which is you know the company app uh, behind the crisis. So that's also biggest asset of that company is also is game engine, right? So like they look at game engines. These are all simulation tech、um, that goes beyond just entertainment. They will have you know widespread、uh, use cases you know when it comes to even. Uh, military sort of attack and all those things. I did see the news about you know their fifty billion yuan pledge、um, in the news. I think it was today or yesterday, and so will be very interesting to see how that a、uh, hundred billion in total will be will be spent. And my last question, I, I I would like to ask you know for your thoughts on the Chinese gaming space in general for the future. And I know that it was、uh, about I think two days ago、um, there was this joint declaration for I think a bunch of Chinese like independent gaming studios, right? They they came together and、um, declared you know they're against Taobao for bootleg games、uh, that were very rampant everywhere, etc. So want, just wanted to hear your your thoughts on that and what you think will happen to the Chinese gaming space、uh, in the future. What are some you know trends that we should look out for? Yeah, I think you know, game is probably the the purest aspect of you know developing technology, right? Because you know, if you look at Elon Musk, if you look at、uh, Mark Zuckerberg, all these guys, you know, started their interest in technology when they were sort of programming for games when they. So I think that you know was able to capture that organic force of you know,、uh, and that attracted a lot of talents that way. You know, for the gaming industry in China, it's definitely going to be a whole lot more regulated going forward. Like I just said, that you know, because games, you know, people like you, it's hard to stop people from want, wanting to play games, especially the tech savvy ones, right? That's why when you ban the console gaming. From 2000 to 2015, the gray markets grew at at a re- very fast pace, right? So I think it's always going to be a cat and mouse sort of game between regulators and tech companies when it comes to、uh, video games. I think that you know there's also one angle that is you know bound to come up a whole lot more going forward. China sees you know video games as a great vehicle through which it can export their, its value and then try to tell its you know stories and all those things. The publicity department have have given repeated speeches about how you know. Gaming companies should have you know higher purpose and then encouraging your know, positive values and all those things. With, with Chinese games influence continue to spread, I think you know there will be a bit of geopolitical angle to this, where companies, fans, and and government officials overseas will、um, see this as a cultural export kind of thing. Now we see a lot of the controversy in you know how Marvel movies or you know Disney movies are being censored and then you know be altered to like Beijing's liking and then you know that been sort of you know created a lot of discussions right and then I think then you know games will increasingly fall into those bracket of conversation as well I, I think it's a fascinating space going forward definitely and I think it'll be cool if we added you know more you know Chinese history or cultural aspects to to the gaming design not that I am a big gamer or know what, what's out there but、uh, if there Board games like that, yeah. <laughs> I, I see you was it、uh, putting up all these sort of like nice costumes and you know Chinese hanf and these kind of things, right? Yes, very into it. So actually, there are a lot of Chinese games that have these aspects intertwined into the game design. So I, I think very much sort of momentum behind the whole hanf renaissance, so to speak. Part of it came from like the gaming community, right? The gaming cosplay communities, right? Because like I guess you know those are the people who sort of like led the first charge. Into it, and then obviously, sort of, you know, became more mainstream, and people see the appeal everywhere. Definitely, it's it's a lot of the same crowd, you know, those who who are on Billy Billy all the time. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. That was my last question. Not exactly because one more. Do you have something to recommend to our audience? You know, like a book, a podcast, or a game? People are increasingly talking about game as like the ninth art form, right? So um, I think really games is you know, where technology meets art. My favorite games are Red Dead Redemption as well as uh, The Last of Us. So like, you know, for gamers out there, uh, those are familiar names but then for those who like you know want to experience like the sort of the, the full ability of it you know those are the good games to uh, get a taste of in so far as you know a book i think you know jason stryer who now writes for uh, bloomberg uh wrote a terrific book about about video game development it, he really sort of looked into like you know what propel these game developers you know forward as well as uh, their you know struggles and then their aspirations and increasingly a lot of labor issues are coming up so i think you know a lot of the union walkouts a lot of the the, the strikes uh these are also uh important stories that you know jason had been uh very diligently covering so you know follow him to follow some of these like you know worldwide gaming stories in china some of the chinese media like yoshi putao or yoshi a uh, game look you know these are all sort of you know good media outlets to follow if you know that's of your interest although they can be a bit niche but then i don't think but i think with you know gaming becoming even more mainstream going forward those things will um continue to dominate our conversations. Nice. A super on point recommendations, which I think our um, audience will appreciate no matter if they are a gamer or not. And of course, um, they will probably want to, you know, read more of your reports coming up on, you know, on the gaming industry in, in China and in Asia. So where can our audience find you? Yeah. So I'm pretty active on Twitter, I guess Unlike the myself. sort of best way to, that's how we become your know, internet friends, that's uh, true. you know, Although I haven't been on Twitter for quite a few months now. But what is your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is the Rio Josh. Yeah. So yeah, so follow me there. Um, I tweet pretty regularly. You know, whenever I want a break from writing, I go on Twitter. Obviously, the most, you know, uh, reliable way to follow me is through my author page at SCMP. Um, we have a beautifully designed author page there. And if you was to uh, use our app, you can also follow me specifically. So like, those are the sort of great avenues through which you can find me. And you can find us on Twitter as well. Um, that is at uh, Analyze Asia. That is Analyze with an S. Although I don't use my personal Twitter as frequently anymore, but our podcast account is always very active. And you can find all of our uh, previous episodes uh, on all podcasting platforms uh, everywhere. Thank you so much, Josh, for coming on to Analyze Asia. It's, it's so nice meeting you as an internet friend, finally, uh, via our, our podcast. And I do hope that, you know, you have a chance to come on again in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for um, you know, this great conversation. And for everybody out there, stay safe and we will see you next time. Bye bye.